Well, thanks to all of you uh, Mississippi State good people for inviting an Ole Miss boy to speak at something at Mississippi State where cowbells were ringing and so forth. Uh, but in full disclosure, my dad went to Mississippi State and, and my little boys are huge Mississippi State fans ever since Dak Prescott came along. So, uh, so I do have some maroon blood in me up here. So I'm not, I'm not altogether uncomfortable speaking at Mississippi State. But several people I've met today have even said, how did you get involved in this? And I said, well, I'm primarily a trucking attorney. I defend trucking companies primarily. And I work with, with folks like uh, Mississippi Highway Patrol and investigating accidents and trying to figure out what happened and trying to recreate what happened. And we work with a lot of engineers to determine what happened in a motor vehicle crash. And in the old days, we had uh, ECMs on the truck tractors we'd download. We could get some speed and braking data on that. Then cars began to have the ACM, the airbag control modules. We could get speed and braking there. Now suddenly all these eyewitnesses are unnecessary because the car and the truck can tell us how fast they were going and whether they braked or not. So it's really changing, and I saw that changing the way I practice law, and I started wondering, am I going to have a job much longer doing this? Because if the cars can tell us what happened, you don't need a lawyer to figure it out, or perhaps an engineer. So, so we've all got to be thinking ahead and how it affects our, our jobs and our careers. So that's kind of how I got into this, and as I started presenting, and usually I'm presenting to trucking companies, so uh, I, I hope that some of this is not too vanilla for some of you who are really on the end of creating and, and envelop, uh, developing some of this technology. But uh, so I'm usually having to encourage them. I'm somewhat, I guess, uh, an ambassador for autonomous vehicles because I'm usually looking at a crowd that's snarling at me and angry saying that's junk science, it's not gonna happen. So I'm having to walk them through the process to get them to a point to believe that this is actually gonna happen one day and that we're all going to have to consider it, deal with it, uh, and maybe even alter our occupations a little bit because of it. So here's where we're headed to the level five uh, autonomous driving level. I know that's where Clay wants to get and, and MSU Cavs wants to get. Uh, and here's a little promo from a company that we actually have in Brookhaven, Mississippi called Aptiv, you've probably heard of. I like to move it, move it. You like to move it. You are born to move, to go and see and learn and do. To imagine what's next and dream of what could be. So are we. Meet Aptiv the technology company that's moving mobility forward, designing, engineering, and enabling solutions for how we'll move tomorrow. Bringing connectivity, smart cities, and autonomous vehicles to life in ways only we can. We're writing the software, building the hardware, then connecting it all together and making it work. Creating a world where everything will talk to everything. Cars to roads, Roads to drivers, drivers to computers. At Aptiv, we don't just envision a world that's safer, smarter, greener, and better connected. We're making it a reality today. And some of you may know that, that Delphi, the big part supplier, split itself in half back in December and created a new company called Aptiv. Aptiv is going to be their self-driving component of Delphi, and they rebranded a plant we have down in Brookhaven, Mississippi to an active plant, so we're proud of that. Now that we've moved uh, forward, let's take a step backwards. When I started thinking about the uh, autonomous vehicle revolution, I started thinking about another revolution that occurred back in the, about 1900, so I thought we'd better start right there to uh, remind people how times have changed, and this isn't the first time. So if you look at this picture, interestingly enough, look what's in front of the wheels of the of the wagon there, which was a problem back then, apparently. Overcrowding was a problem back then as well. So the, the modern automotive era began with a competition to promote new technology because people back then talked about a horseless carriage. So a fix uh, was, was being addressed. They were looking for a fix for the problems being caused by horses. In the 1890s, big cities were struggling with the problem of horse manure and other things in the city streets. It was becoming quite a problem. In 1894, the London Times published an article that estimated by 1940, every street in the city would be buried under nine feet of manure. So they were looking for a clean alternative to horses. So the, the horseless carriage people, kind of like the AV people today, promised to provide the speed of, the speed of a train, flexibility of a horse, and the convenience of a bicycle. So the big question then was steam, electric, or gas. There were, there were three sort of competing interests as to what was going to turn out to be the engine they would use. And in Paris in July of 1894, 
they had a competition and they lined up a 21 contraptions there and by the end seven dogs got run over a few bicycles got hit and uh, 17 miraculously made it to the finish line but the big winner in it all was not the contestant but Gottlieb Daimler who was an inventor and Daimler was the one who had come up with the internal combustion gas engine that four of the vehicles that, that actually won had used so that really established the gasoline engine back at its time as the model would use for the 20th century and also interestingly the term automobiles began to spread from the French term to other English speaking languages and back then unlike today cars were seen as the clean and hygienic version of something to replace a far worse problem which was the horses and what came along with the horses so the the modern era of autonomous vehicles now looking jumping fast forward but it also began with a competition many of you know of the DARPA challenge in the Mojave Desert March of 2004 it was a 150 mile off-road coast we should have had the Cavs halo vehicle then we would have won won this thing for sure 12 teams started and nobody finished. The farthest vehicle went 7.4 miles, so it was a flop. Fast forward to 18 months later, they did it again, and this time five of the 23 teams finished the race. So in just 18 months, it went from a hopeless situation to a feasible situation in that short of time frame. Then in November of 2007, with a much more difficult urban course, six of the 11 teams finished the competition. And in 2009, a lot of the people that were involved in the DARPA challenges introduced the Google self-driving car project. And uh, here's where that's kind of where we start today. So here, here's where we are, I guess. Oh, driverless car. Select destination. Hi, um, I'm going to 5230 Newell Road, Palo Alto. Route guidance calibrated. Distance to destination, 4.6 miles. Buckle up, please. Okay. <laughs> Enjoy your ride. <laughs> Destination override. New destination, 1 Gregory Drive, Air Along. Distance to destination, 4,126 miles. Enjoy your ride. Um, what's happening? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Mr. Carr? This is Monica. Hi, Monica, it's Jared. Uh, quick question. Jared, I can't talk right now. One of our assistants has been confusing the eastern and western time zones with airline on work orders. Now a bunch of important things are happening a day early. Peter is going to be furious when he finds out. He's going to make that noise. Oh, shit, that's him on the other line. I got to go. Oh, wait, Monica, I just... Hi, Peter. Hello, Monica? Um, Carr? Mr. Carr? Uh, excuse me. Aralon is an island, so how are we, um, oh no, 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 stop, let me out. Um, 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 uh, that's not good. Oh, no, no, excuse me, please. Please honk, please honk. No, 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 please, please. Oh no, that's not good. Okay, Donald, stay calm. One hundred three hours to destination. Entering sleep mode. What? Enjoy your ride. No. Okay, stay calm. Stay calm. Wait, my phone. No bars, no bars, no bars, no bars. <laughs> right, so unfortunately, uh, public perception sometimes is, is like that and not what we what we want it to be. That's uh, from the HBO series called Silicon Valley, which I thought was uh, fitting for this. Uh, how many of you ever claimed to be an excellent driver? Most of us. Have you ever had an argument with your spouse or friend about who's the better driver? Everybody thinks they're an excellent driver. But the answer to that, as we all know, is none of us. And I, I love this quote, if you're afraid of robot cars, you should be terrified of human drivers. 
because in the U.S., these, these numbers are staggering, and if it was anything else, we would be screaming and be outraged by this. Six million crashes a year, 2.5 million injuries, 37,000 deaths per year. That's 100 plus deaths a day in the U.S. alone, and some 650,000 road deaths since the year 2000. And 95 or 94 percent of that has been judged to be caused by human error. So the, the numbers are just shocking. You would think there would be a, a more outrage about this and, and looking for a way to fix it, which is, of course, what we're trying to do. The, uh, and it's, it's only getting worse. This was from, from 2017. And I actually saw some numbers. I think it said in Mississippi in, in 2016, 690 people were killed on the roadways in Mississippi. So, so we're, uh, we're right in the middle of this. Globally, it's even worse, 1.25 million deaths annually, 3,200 deaths a day. So the math is clear. If 90% of the accidents are caused by human beings, we need to get the human beings out from behind the wheel, right? So the future of safety then lies with getting us, us bad, distractive drivers from behind the steering wheel. NHTSA, the insurance industry, the automotive industry are all on board. They're all racing to see who can develop this technology the quickest. Car makers are having to reinvent themselves. They're having to look more like mobility providers instead of car makers and offering services such as ride sharing. So the, so the new mantra in the, the car business is they're selling rides and not cars. Or that's what their future will be. Those are just some interesting quotes that I pulled about the disruption that will be caused by the AV industry. And even in the middle there, the statistic that by 2030, some 95% of U.S. passenger miles may be by on-demand autonomous electric vehicles. There's a lot going on in that, that sentence or that statement in red there, what all that means. And a lot of things got to come together at one time. So we think the new technology can resolve perhaps 80% or more of the crashes, even little things at one at a time, like the electronic uh, stability control that many of your cars, newer cars have now, are estimated to save 2,200 lives in a two-year period after they first came out. And, and this was a great quote, too, that one writer has speculated that our, our grandchildren will look at us one day and go, y'all actually drove those things? Are you crazy? You drove the car yourself? You know, that was, that was you know, crazy that you had all these numbers and accidents and, and uh, you let the humans do this. But the federal government's behind it 100 percent, so you'll see the numbers. President Trump quickly appointed uh, the number three person from Lyft at, uh, at DOT. President Obama had uh, four billion dollars set aside for testing of AVs. NHTSA and DOT are bullish and pushing this very, uh, with all the the guidelines that they can. Congress has actually passed some legislation at the end of last year. The public perception, and I, I put changes frequently because after the Uber crash in Arizona uh, back in March, public perception, you know, kind of up and down depending on what's in the news. But one of the things that, uh, one of the other problems we have here in the United States is we love to drive. Chicken and dumplings, where we'll all have chicken and dumplings when she comes. I love to drive. Boy, you sure said something there, partner. Yes, sir. That's from Raising Arizona when they broke out of prison. His first thing is, I do love to drive. And that's one of the things people ask me. Well, I love to drive my own car. I don't want an autonomous vehicle. So questions, uh, there's many questions as answers probably. But I always like to, to tell people this is, it's, it's not really magic. We've been adding things to our cars layer by layer for a long time. I mean, think of the things when you grew up and you didn't even wear a seat belt. You used to sit in the back windshield of your mama's car back there and ride around. I mean, things have changed a lot, and all those things have helped us to create a more safe vehicle. Those are some of the existing diagnostic tools we use today. It's already a computer with wheels under it already. The advanced driver systems, uh, the biggest one that's, that's come out recently is the automatic emergency braking. And you see some of the numbers there that they, they estimate it'll save 700,000 police reported rear end crashes using 2013 
data. I know some of the trucking companies like J.B. Hunt has already done this, and it's, it's reduced their rear, little rear ender fender bender cases dramatically. That completed uh, with the lane departure warnings and some of the other systems combined and adaptive cruise control have, have really created a, a, a car that's approaching the point of driving itself. Uh, and then here's Cadillac, which you can get today. Innovation isn't always about what you add, but what you're able to take away. Introducing Super Cruise, the world's first true hands-free driving system for the highway. Here's how it works. Enter the highway. Stay in your lane. Wait for the Super Cruise icon to appear. Push the Super Cruise button. When the steering wheel turns green and things look safe, let go. It's as simple as that. No need to tap the wheel every minute to show you're there. That doesn't mean you can check out. You and Super Cruise are partners. If you need to pass another car, take the wheel and make your move. Super Cruise will then automatically take back control. Safety plays an important part in how it works. Proprietary head tracking software helps make sure your eyes are on the road. And if not, visual alerts and vibrating seat reminders signal you to grab the wheel. LiDAR mapping and enhanced GPS know what lane you're in on the highway. Map curvature data and a precision camera know the position of your car up to 2,500 meters ahead. It makes you feel like you're riding on rails. The result? The world's first true hands-free driving system for the highway. And with safety and innovation at its core, it delivers the greatest luxuries of all. Trust, confidence, and peace of mind. So that's interesting, a, a vehicle you can get today that raises some question marks with the legal community and regulatory and state to state right now that doesn't even allow that. So, uh, that, but that's another topic. So here's the, uh, the cars of the future. What are we going to be looking at down the road? Just some designs of the, the pod concept and my, my sons have asked, could they play Fortnite in there on that TV? And I said, well, well sure, that's, that's what you'll be able to do in here without driving it. We'll be uh, looking at a lot of fleet subscription choices, perhaps, for our vehicles. Uh, all, all part of the trends of the ride sharing, ride hailing, plus autonomous driving, plus electrification. So a lot of changes coming at us all at once, kind of from different directions. But the ride hailing, you're familiar with Uber and Lyft, of course, but the ride sharing is a little unusual to us around here, at least. It's bigger in Europe, some other places, maybe California, but where you can actually put your car into a fleet and, and rent it because, you know, the, the whole problem with owning a car is it sits in the driveway 94% of the time. It's like having a condo at the beach you never use. So people will start to realize how much of your household budget is devoted to paying for your car tag maintenance and upkeep insurance of it. And you'll think, well, this doesn't make sense for my family to have five cars. We'll have one car maybe and then we'll share the rest of the time. So it'll, it'll change the way people think we believe. So um, I met, I went to a, a seminar where Get Around was there and it was a young lady who had started this idea in, in California and she got Toyota to, to partner with her. They had cars sitting on lots that weren't used. She had an idea and an app and they partnered with her to create Get Around and they estimate they can take 10 cars off the road for each one of these shared cars that they, they use. So by 2025 estimates are that, that private car ownership may all but end in the in the US. Now switching gears a little bit to electric vehicles, elect, you know, people get confused with electric vehicles versus autonomous vehicles and I try to split the two apart here but look at what some of our uh, European countries are doing here. They're, they're taking a very strong stance on this with some of the deadlines that uh, they've instituted to get rid of gas and diesel cars in these other countries so that's a wake-up call to the manufacturers that we've got to get some electric vehicles out there and get them out there fast. And they're all now in a race to do that. Volvo's taking a strong position. They want to be the leader. They want to be known as the leader in electric cars. With GM and Ford not far behind, they're all announcing all these different electric versions of their vehicles they're going to come out with. And I was uh, just looking at Germany. That was surprising to me that uh, one in five cars worldwide carry a German brand. They've got a tremendous market in Germany that uh, you know, they're, they've got their own issues. They're not as advanced battery-wise in some things as, as we've been here. So 
we're thinking it'll, it'll mostly affect larger cities and urban areas first before it gets to more rural places. But uh, we think that, uh, like I said, I, I drive an O2 Sequoia, and people say, well, you're talking about autonomous vehicles. Why are you driving that old car? I said, because I'm never going to buy another one. That's why. So, so that's the answer. That's what you can tell people about your old car. So from evolution to revolution, it's just layering. That's what I try to convince the, my trucking crowds of. It's just a layering on of systems. You've already got these systems and you know, going from a seat belt to an airbag. You just, by the time you, you add on all the systems, you will have yourself uh, a self-driving car. And it's passive to active right now when you're driving and that you, you hit the, the yellow line and your right side of your seat rumbles you know, or you, you go to the left and it starts to rumble on the left side of your seat, which for me, when I rent a car, is always scary to me because my car doesn't have any of that. But it will go from passive warning to actively taking control, and that's really all it is, and it's just a um, moving forward of all the systems. Here's some of the players that we're looking at, and you've, you've all heard these names before, some of the non-traditional software type manufacturers versus your traditional automobile manufacturers. Uh, one of our earlier speakers talked about some of the mergers, but uh, if you don't think this is happening, look at the money that's being spent here with GM purchasing Lyft for $500 million and, and then purchasing Cruise Automation for a billion, Ford's merger with uh, Argo AI. So a lot, lots going on. And Aurora is an interesting company. That's started by former Google and Tesla um, and Uber guys, and they've, they've just partnered with Byton, which is a, they call it the Chinese Tesla, and they hope to sell cars in China in 2019 and the U.S. by 2020. Those are some of the other mergers and acquisitions. Like I mentioned, Aptiv, they were doing at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this year, their partnership um, between um, Aptiv and, um, and uh, Lyft. They were doing self-driving taxis in Las Vegas, and they got tremendously high ratings from that experience, from the people who did that. And so now they've really invested more in the, the Las Vegas market. So if you're there, you can try to hail an active Lyft uh, self-driving taxi. And about 50 companies are actively testing, or at least have permits today in California to test autonomous vehicles. And this is probably my favorite quote of all with regard to testing. It's the wild west out there for testing self-driving cars, and the developers want to go where there's the least amount of sheriffing going on. So that's, uh, that says a lot about it, and, and Arizona picked up on that, that thought, and Doug Ducey, the governor of Arizona, signed an executive order in 2015 to try to steal away some of this testing and some of this em employment and business from California, and he did that. So he got uh, a, lot of, a lot of business. Uber packed up and moved to Arizona for the most part. And uh, there's an interesting article. This is the New York Times. If you ever want to read one article, I'd recommend to you. It's called Where Self-Driving Cars Go to Learn. And it's about the Arizona experience and, and Governor Ducey reaching out to try to open the state's doors for testing there, because it's had a great uh, impact on Arizona's economy. Some of the metrics, uh, you, you guys know this, the disengagements, the number of times the driver has to take back over the car is uh, one of the, the metrics they use. We've talked about the testing on public roads, testing and, and simulation. There's also a legal gray area out there as I mentioned, Pennsylvania, where, where Uber, around Pittsburgh area, Uber is testing, they don't really have any statutes directly in AVs one way or the other. And in uh, the Cadillac commercial we showed a while ago, that's available, but uh, that's, not, that's not technically allowed in a lot of states. So there's still a legal gray area out there to look at. There's the, the Waymo Google car. Waymo's probably the leader of the pack right now. They've, uh, they've got over five million, I think it's actually six million dry, uh, miles driven on public roads and five billion in simulation, and they boast the fewest disengagement per 1,000 miles. And here's now, a, back then, a little bit from Most Waymo people thought self-driving cars recently. were nothing more than science fiction. But this dedicated team of dreamers believed that self-driving vehicles could make transportation safer, easier, and more accessible for everyone. And so, the Google self-driving car project was born. Now fast forward to 2018, and the Google self-driving car project is now its own independent alphabet company called Waymo. And we've moved well beyond tinkering and research. Today, Waymo is the only company in the world with a fleet of fully self-driving cars with no one in the driver's seat on public roads. 
Now, members of the public in Phoenix, Arizona, have already started to experience some of these fully self-driving rides, too. Let's have a look. Okay, day one of self-driving. Are you ready? Go. Oh, this is weird. <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> yeah, she was like, is there no one driving that car? <laughs> I knew it. I was waiting for it. So Phoenix will be the first stop for Waymo's driverless transportation service, which is launching later this year. Soon, everyone will be able to call Waymo using our app, and a fully self-driving car will pull up with no one in the driver's seat to whisk them away to their destination. And that's just the beginning. Because at Waymo, we're not just building a better car. We're building a better driver. And that driver can be used in all kinds of applications. So ride hailing, logistics, personal cars, connecting people to public transportation. And we see our technology as an enabler for all of these different industries. And we intend to partner with lots of different companies to make this self-driving future a reality for everyone. And today, I want to tell you about two areas where AI has made a huge impact, perception, and prediction. So first, perception. Detecting and classifying objects is a key part of driving. And pedestrians, in particular, pose a unique challenge because they come in all kinds of shapes, postures, and sizes. So for example, here's a construction worker picking out of a manhole with most of his body obscured. Here's a pedestrian crossing the street concealed by a plank of wood. And here, we have pedestrians who are dressed in inflatable dinosaur costumes. But our cars have a lot more than just cameras. We also have lasers to measure distance and shapes of objects, and radars to measure their speed. And by applying machine learning to this combination of sensor data, we can accurately detect pedestrians in all forms in real time. A second area where machine learning has been incredibly powerful for Waymo is predicting how people will behave on the road. Now, sometimes people do exactly what you expect them to, and sometimes, they don't. Take this example of a car running a red light. Unfortunately, we see this kind of thing uh, more than we'd like. But let me break this down from the car's point of view. Our car is about to proceed straight through an intersection. We have a clear green light, and cross traffic is stopped with a red light. But just as we enter the intersection, all the way in the right corner, we see a vehicle coming fast. Our models understand that this is unusual behavior for a vehicle that should be decelerating. We predict the car will run the red light. So we preemptively slow down, which you can see here with this red fence, and this gives the red light runner room to pass in front of us while it barely avoids hitting another vehicle. All right, so GM Cruise is a big player as well. They've uh They've just announced they're going to produce a car with no steering wheel or brake pedals in 2019, which is pretty big news. And they are uh, coming out with their own ride hailing app with the, the Lyft network. So it looks like there's a, a showdown with GM Cruise and Waymo for driverless taxis, and it, it's brewing in, in Arizona right now. And by the way, GM Cruise uh, boasts the second best disengagement numbers to Waymo. This is the if you don't believe me, this is a headline uh, from the paper about the, the car from 2019, and then here's a little video clip of it, the steering wheel. So then some of the, the systems that we already see, we talked about redundancy earlier. Here is just a, a, an idea of some of the different sensors and the redundancy the cars will have and for backup. Uber's been in the news a lot lately, and 
as I mentioned earlier, they had moved a lot of their testing operations from California to Arizona, and their, their disengagement numbers were not looking very, very uh, good at the time. And then, of course, March 18th, they had the crash where they uh, hit a pedestrian in, in Arizona. They settled, the, they settled the case quickly. There was no lawsuit filed, which is interesting from a lawyer standpoint because there was no discovery taken, no legal precedent was set by this accident. But it's a, from what I've read, they had removed certain equipment from the cars and they had recently gone from two test drivers to one. And, and then this is just this week, I just added this slide, I read in the paper this weekend that they, Uber had announced they were gonna abandon their Arizona testing and they've already given notice to the 300 employees there that they were gonna terminate the program in, in Arizona. But it, it did say that they would restart testing in Pittsburgh after the investigation into the Arizona crash is over and possibly consider going back to California for testing. And they, they've hired the former NTSB chairman to do a top to bottom review um, of the, the program. The Tesla uh, also is getting a lot of press Every time a Tesla's in a crash, they try to say it was because it was an autopilot. And, you know, we, we don't know if that's true or not true. But we, the, you know, the famous fatality where the driver was killed, he, he mistook a, a, a tractor trailer for bright sunlight or something like that in, in Florida. But interestingly, they determined that it was the crash prevention system that failed and not the autopilot system. So, and, and Tesla's trying to do things a little differently. They're not, they're trying to do it without LIDAR. Someone mentioned earlier the cost and expense of LIDAR. So Tesla's trying to do it primarily with video. So they're, they're taking a little bit different model from a technology side. This is the, the level of automation we talked about earlier. Now switching gears to self-driving trucks a little bit, the Otto Uber company that did a, a beer delivery in Colorado back in, in 2016, Otto was later purchased by Uber and that led to the big lawsuit out in California where Google and Uber tied it up earlier this year and ended up reaching a, a settlement. Embark has a, an exit exit strategy where they want to turn over the interstate driving, the boring driving that makes truck drivers sleepy. They want to turn that over to the Embark system and let the driver get a break and get some rest. Similarly, Starsky Robotics has, a, has an add-on system, it's aftermarket kit that they add to the, the vehicle. There's a picture of the Embark, and Embark's also partnered with Ryder, and I'll show you a little bit of this, this video with Ryder. This is an incredibly exciting time in our industry. Literally 15 months ago, Embark bought a truck and drove it into our warehouse. 15 months later, we're here moving actual freight on the I-10 with our automated truck. Embark, Electrolux, and Ryder are working together, running the longest automated freight route in the world today. 650 miles, starting in Texas and ending in California. Electrolux is a global provider of both home and professional appliances, like the Frigidaire line, who drive over 100 million miles per year. We're excited about partnering with Embark, and we believe it's really gonna support our focus on providing a sustainable and efficient network for our consumers and our customers. Ryder's a North American transportation company. We manage over 230,000 vehicles across North America serving over half of Fortune 500 companies today. Embark's approach is unique. Our automation is designed specifically for the highway, and we rely on riders, trucks, and drivers to ferry freight between the warehouses and the interstate. Embark's trucks pick up at the edge of the interstate, and from there, the computer drives it 650 miles all the way to California. We think that safety is super important to everything we're doing, and so we don't want to be taking any risks when we're testing this system. We have a driver in the seat, he's there watching the road, making sure everything is safe, and that way we're able to go out and test this as much as possible while being incredibly confident that everything we're doing is safe. Moving freight for Frigidaire is a huge milestone for Embark. Going from a lab to actual freight on an actual freight route is a huge step towards commercializing our technology. We're really excited, not just about what we're doing here right now, but about expanding this as we go forward over the coming months. We're gonna be working with Electrolux and Ryder to add trucks, add routes, and prove out the system so that eventually we're able to roll this out as a fully autonomous truck. The, the next video is on Starsky Robotics, a simpler company where they uh, 
claimed to have the longest end-to-end -end run on record delivering Hurricane Irma aid through Florida. That's a picture of the Starsky robotic system. You can see here uh, where the pedals are. This is the, the add-on aftermarket kit that Starsky does. And then this is their driver. You, you may not be able to tell, but he's sitting in an office. And those are three computer screens around him that look like windshields. So the Starsky model is that he will monitor several trucks at a time going down the interstate where they shouldn't require any intervention. But then when one pulls off of an exit, he can remotely drive the unit sitting here in an office somewhere else as if he's sitting in the cab of the vehicle. Today, we're gonna do the first ever unmanned test of a self-driving commercial truck on the road. So as you'll see, there is no one in our truck. No one hiding back there. And especially not anyone here in the driver's seat. So it is time for us to do the thing that we've been trying to do since we started this darn thing. So the, that truck was uh, uh, apparently being driven about 300 miles away by a guy sitting at his, at his office. So for the trucking industry, the numbers probably give the most incentive to develop the technology, more so than, than cars at this point, because if you look at the cost of a truck driver and the cost of, uh, of the hours of service restrictions where the truck can only drive 11 hours a day, so your asset is sitting still the rest of the time, uh, and, and Starsky and others claim that they can put this self-driving kit on there for $23,000. The, the math is clear that the trucking companies need to be looking very closely at this. So platooning is, is, is what we've just passed in Mississippi this past legislative session, and Peloton and some others are really big in the platooning industry, which lets the trucks, they're kind of electronically tethered to one another, and it creates a fuel savings, as you'll see. And, and of course, every 1% every that the trucking companies can save, they're, they're very interested in doing that. Partner available. Proceed at 54 miles per hour. some of the electric trucks that are out there that are on the market. You've all heard about the Tesla semi that Elon Musk introduced in the uh, end of 17. There's another picture. This is, this is his big splash. One thing we care about Tesla is we really care about performance. We want, it, we want a, a vehicle that feels incredible, that accelerates like nothing else. But the, Tesla, the Tesla semi will go zero to 60 in five seconds. Yeah. So that, that's by itself or with a trailer. Now at 80,000 pounds max gross vehicle weight, that's the most amount of weight you can carry on a US highway. This is the real time acceleration of a Tesla Semi. That, uh, on the left, the thing that looks like it's not moving <laughs> is a diesel truck. Now what about up a hill? So I'll, I'll skip on through this, but the Nikola's getting a lot of publicity recently. It's a hydrogen fuel cell, different than Tesla, which is battery, a true battery. But Anheuser-Busch just recently placed a big order with Nikola for these, these tractors. And you'll see U.S. Express, one of the largest uh, trucking carriers in the country, has also placed a big, big order with them. So, so they're starting to get orders and starting to develop here, their, their range, uh, you'll see 500 to 1,200 miles is better on these hydrogen cell trucks than the traditional battery 
electric trucks. And they, again, are planning to build a $1 billion factory in Arizona. So there are just some pictures of the Nikola truck. Uh, Thor is another startup in California right now that's building a, a, a traditional battery pack truck to compete with, with Tesla. And Toyota, I, I just I hadn't seen this until recently, but Toyota's come out with a hydrogen fuel cell. And interestingly, their truck looks like a truck, whereas the others look like a futuristic type thing. But the Toyota model uh, looks more like a traditional truck. There's a lot of arguments for and against electric versus the, uh, the traditional diesel vehicles. Um, and I'll skip through some of this, but Uber Freight has a load matching app they've come out with and, and all this adds up to what the two schools of thought. One is that these trucks will help make better, safer drivers just by taking a little bit of the load off on interstate driving and things that cause you to get drowsy, whereas the, the unions seem to think that we don't want any self-driving trucks because they're going to take all the truck driving jobs away. So there's a big battle brewing over, over that. This is uh, drones and, and uh, IoT I brought into the presentation a little bit, and I've got a video, but I'll, I'll skip it. But basically, UPS has tested a drone that lifts off the top of the truck and makes one package delivery while the, the driver makes one. So it uh, increases the amount of deliveries that can be made over time. Uh, some of the 3D printing stuff, I know you guys know Local Motors. They printed a 75% 3D printed vehicle and uh, have this concept of micro factories and can walk in and order a car and print it for you in 12 hours. So there's a picture of the, the dune buggy looking prototype car from Local Motors. So um, a lot of people think the robot is the, the, the enemy to us, but uh, we think it can make possibly safer drivers for us all. This is a lot of the V2V, V2I that you all are familiar with that you know, the federal government through NHTSA is, is talking about making mandatory here soon. So basically that everything connects with everything. Every red light's connected to every car, every plane, every ship, everything's connected and talking and communicating with each other. And so we have this final convergence in the car of the future, which are smart cities, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, connected cars, and smart roads and infrastructure. There's problems, I mean, there's, there's no uh, doubting that there are a lot of problems out there that we haven't solved yet that we're gonna have to figure out as we go. The state regulation, we've got 32 states now that have adopted some sort of AV legislation. Virginia's a leader with their automated corridor program. Um, Nevada was one of the first to allow AV testing. That's just a picture, that's what the Virginia Department has done through Virginia Tech with their uh, Virginia automated corridors. They're ready to see the federal regulations, and it's just a balancing test. How much room do you give the innovators to develop this technology versus how do you put the brakes on them for public safety? So you've got the, a balancing test here, but there was a, the first federal automated vehicle policy came out in the Obama administration. That's a picture of it there, September 16. And then the Trump administration released a vision for safety 2.0, we call it, in September of last year. It's a much smaller document, but basically allows the open-ended testing and encourages it. That's the Self-Drive Act. The U.S. House passed at the end of 17. The AV Start Act was considered by the U.S. Senate, but they, they got into tax uh, legislation and didn't finish it, so that's still on the table. And, and switching gears quickly to the, uh, the negligence aspects of the law, it's a question of going from traditional driver negligence, which we're all used to, to a product liability theory of negligence, because if there's no driver behind the wheel and if there's no steering wheel, how can the driver be liable? So now it's a product liability case and, and some software must have failed. So they, uh, there also looks to be a shift from traditional automobile insurance to more product liability insurance. Some have thought that perhaps we should even limit liability to the manufacturers to encourage the innovation. And you know, the bigger question is, do we treat the AV technology like a human or do we treat it like a piece of equipment and who owns it? And in what situations is the driver still in charge? So say so you have automatic emergency braking, but the driver was also texting. So you could say it was the automatic emergency braking that failed or you could say it was the driver's fault because he had the obligation to still step in and control the vehicle. So there's still some room to keep the, the driver liable. So the insurance companies are looking at this, they're studying it, the car companies, to their credit, have several have publicly stated they'll accept full liability if a car has a, an accident while in self-driving mode. Crash investigations, which, we, which I do all day, most days, 
is a question of whether it's driver error or software failure now, so we're going to have to learn how to use new experts and new technology to recreate accidents. The uh, Uber Elevate came out recently. I wanted to throw this in because Uber has, has got the Uber Air program, and they're they're really serious about this and moving forward with it. Uh, that's that's a, a picture of this VTOL. They call it a vertical takeoff and landing VTOL. Here's what they're looking at doing. That's just an uh, image of what Ubers want to do with air taxi to help with the alleviate the urban uh, congestion. So in conclusion, we've got a lot to do still with laws and regulations, uh, with liability insurance. Here's a, I'd like to finish with who's in and who's out. So who's in, product liability insurance, electric charging stations, software companies, LIDAR companies, drones, Embark and Starsky, flying cars, infrastructure contractors and smart cities, who's out? personal car ownership, personal auto insurance, car dealers, they're gonna really affect the car dealer industry, traditional gas stations, uh, as I like to say, telephone book and billboard lawyers who make their living off small fender benders. There shouldn't be as many fender benders anymore. Um, this is a quick picture. This was at uh, AV 2018 San Mateo. That's actually Bob Sadowski. He's the chief roboticist for the U.S. Army who we, we took a ride in this uh, self-driving car here together. Right? Yeah. Yeah, same thing in Illinois. So this we, is we, we do have a, a test driver with us. This is just driving around the parking lot. So this was my first ride clay in a self driving car, not in quite as uh I'm not saying that just as I'm not exciting as yours yeah. crossing no, it's a, it's, uh, it's difficult boundaries. In to do this. And what's sad is that you have so many innovators. They could have So that was exciting for me to, to get to have that first ride. And then of course my favorite car is right here at Mississippi State University with Clay and everybody. This was in Jackson recently at the uh, C Spire Movement Seminar. But thanks for the invitation. Clay, I appreciate it. Glad to be here and uh, speak with y'all and, and happy to learn more every time that we do one of these seminars and take it back home and put it to good use. So thanks, y'all.